from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. I'm Kent Spellman, I'm the Executive Director of the West Virginia Community Development Hub, and we're one of the partners who are uh, bringing Turn This Town Around to Grafton and Maywell. Sometimes it's really easy to think about a project and think of it in this way. You know what they ought to do? That's not the kind of project we want to hear about. What we want to hear is, you know what I think I would like to do? This isn't about you identifying what somebody else in Matewan should be doing for the community. It's about saying, this is a project I believe in and this is something I'd invest in. I really believe it helps having other people um, that you can talk to and bring, bring fresh ideas into your community. That's the only way we're going to succeed. Often we find that communities are pointing to they, the, the politicians, the not-for-profit not organizations that typically do community development work and to truly say, to turn your town around, it's in your hands, it's your community. And these might not be the people who are on the radar of the traditional town leaders, but they're people who will show up to meetings, they are people who will bring in new people, um, and they are people who will bring in passion for ideas and issues that we can't know about. Well, Turn This Town Around started in late 2013 when I got a call from Nikki Bowman from New South Media. Uh, Nikki explained that she's been exploring a new magazine called West Virginia Focus, which was going to um, shift from her lifestyle focus, which she uh, has with some of her other publications, to a, a focus on community and economic development issues in West Virginia. And in traveling the state, she uh, goes to a lot of different communities all over the state. And she was able to, uh, she had come to an understanding that these communities, many of them, are at a tipping point where they're going to have to really change the way they're approaching their community or they're going to die on the vine. My name is Nikki Bowman, and I am the editor and publisher of West Virginia Focus magazine. The mission of West Virginia Focus is to build a better state and that build a better state one issue, one business, one town at a time. And our Turn This Town Around campaign is an example of that. We're not just documenting a story and covering a story, a feature. We're part of that. We're a part of the change. We are holding the towns accountable uh, for, for the work that they're doing in their communities. We've been trying to do this ourselves for quite a while, and I was always interested in that. Um, you know, I just really think that we could be something great again if we put, you know, put ourselves to work and, and really believe in it and are determined and have big goals long out that take, you know, time and effort. People don't want to start stuff because they're so afraid that it's going to fail that they won't even get started. And you can't do that. You know, everybody's business started with a dream at one point and they had to do something to get it started. And we can do that with anything, really. Hi, my name's Eric Pores. I'm a community coach. And for Turn This Town Around, I function as a trainer and a facilitator community meetings. The Turn the Town Around process uh, began with really promoting a community meeting, uh, a large format meeting where anybody and everybody from the community was invited to attend. The reason for that was uh, to engage the community in conversation around what are those ideas? What are those low-hanging ideas that uh, people have talked about in their neighborhoods or around the family table about wanting to do but haven't done? And what are those more transformational a little harder to reach projects that would really impact their community. I'm Amanda Yeager. I'm the Director of Community Strategies 
with the West Virginia Community Development Hub, and the Hub is a partner in Turn This Town Around, um, and so I'm kind of the go-to person for both communities. I guess with us, what we like to, what, like when we started this process, it was we started out with, okay, what does, what, do, what does the community need? And of course, money was one of those things on their list of what the community needs. Okay, we, we understand that. So then we'll switch to, so what is it, what do you want to do here? And then that's when we started out with the, they didn't, maybe didn't know it at the time, but that's when they started brainstorming about their projects. So it was more, let's think about the project or the, what they want to do in their community first, and then we thought about the funding on the back end of it. What, what we want to do now is we want to capture based on the scores that five people gave the ideas, we want to capture the first 20, 25 of those ideas. We divided the projects into three categories. The first was what we call low-hanging fruit. These are small projects. They can be done fairly quickly. Um, they are pretty uh, specific to a particular interest. It could be things like um, repairing part of a, of a rail trail. It could be things like painting uh, a caboose, or improving a storefront, or putting uh, benches and flowers on Main Street. These are relatively small projects that start to build some momentum that are visible, immediately visible, and can be accomplished in a short period of time. The second category is the, what we call the intermediate projects. These are going to take a little bit longer. They're going to cost a little bit more. They may require more people to be involved. They could take maybe a year, maybe a little bit more to accomplish those. Uh, and then the, the third category is what we call the bold transformational project. These are going to take years and it's going to take some real deep planning. It's going to require some help in thinking through the planning, some professional help from people who know how to build business plans, who know how to do feasibility studies, who know how to do some more sophisticated uh, funding mechanisms for success with these projects. So that's a different kind of planning. It's much more involved. Um, for that kind of planning, our work with those community teams has to go on for an extended period of time in just, instead of just a few months. Did everybody get one of those blue discs? Does everybody have those? If you don't have a blue disc, Make sure you go over to the table and grab a blue disc or raise your hand. We did something unique in each of the uh, big community-wide planning meetings that we held. Uh, lots of communities have gone through planning sessions. Unfortunately, most of those planning sessions result basically in just a wish list of what we need in Grafton, what we need in Matewan is this, or this, or this. In our community-wide planning sessions, we did something else, something we had never done before. We gave each of the community members as they came to the meeting a blue chip, a little blue um, circular disc. And we asked them to write their name on that and their email and phone number. And we didn't tell them what we were doing with that chip. As we identified projects at those meetings, we wrote the name of each project on a brown paper bag and we placed the bag all around the rooms where the meetings were being held. After those projects had been identified, we then asked the community members to get their blue discs out. We explained that that blue disc represents four hours of community service you will give each month towards improving your community. And we then asked them to take that blue disc and put it in the bag for the project that they wanted to work on. We also gave them the opportunity to get additional discs. So some people, uh, you know, placed four or five discs in bags uh, around the room, saying that they would commit some time every month to working on those community development projects. I think it's really important with these community planning sessions to connect the wish list to the do list and help community members understand that it's not about what you want, it's about what you personally are willing to work on. And I think the blue chip uh, process helped them see that this wasn't going to happen without their direct involvement and their commitment of time and energy. It's not just putting your name on a piece of paper. When you drop that blue chip in and you know you're you're making a commitment, you know, instead of just saying, oh yeah, I'll sign on to that, 
you know, and I think that's a good project, you're not, you're not committing that way. But when you say, I'll give my time to this project, I think that makes it a lot different. It makes it more personal. My name's Charles Hawkeye Dixon. I serve on the, uh, uh, the Mine Wars Museum Board. I attended uh, uh, Turn This Town Around meetings. It's not enough to have a good idea. If you're not willing to put forth the effort to, to make it come true, it's pretty much useless. In essence, it takes more than just money. It takes dedicated people willing to put forth and volunteer their time as well. Yeah, not just the money. Hey, Jim. It's more than just forming a team. That team has to be engaged with the process. They have to come to the meetings. They have to be working on their project consistently. So we require that of those three members of each team, at least two of them attend each of the training sessions that we hosted uh, during the summer. Some of the teams struggled with this. I mean, we're all busy people. You know, we have kids and we have work and we have uh, other commitments that get in the way of attending uh, meetings for improving our community. So um, it's been a challenge in each of the communities. Um, so one of the things we're doing is working with those community teams to sort of find ways to do remedial training. So we make sure that they get the training we're trying to make sure they have for, so that they can be sustainable as a community development entity. But that commitment of team members is absolutely critical. And so the whole process uh, started with recognizing the need for really healthy team dynamics, moving them into the specifics of um, all the requirements that uh, would be necessary to fulfill to, to succeed in their project, all the way through well, what is their budget for that project. So you guys need to fight through the chaos and truly identify a working team and spend time with that team to be effective. We asked teams to be very specific about their team positions. Uh, we asked for them to identify a facilitator who's going to be in charge of kind of orchestrating the meeting. Um, the recorder, who's going to take the notes and disseminate that information, share that information, be the keeper of the knowledge that's taking place and being shared. Um, we ask for a task manager, a uh, very important role. That's the person who's going to say, hey folks, uh, we need to really be accountable. We said we were going to do this by this time and you said you're going to do this by this date. Uh, task manager is a very important position. Um, and then we, we help them understand what does it mean just to be a good team member. I think often we've all been in meetings where uh, we sit down at the table and people like to share their thoughts and ideas. Um, that's not being a, a good team member. You, you need people who can share their ideas but also contribute and do the work. You know, as the team grows and you, you get to know people that are in your team, uh, you find out their strengths and their weaknesses. It's just like a, a, a ball team. And so some of the things that you might have designated for a person to do to start with you might have to be switched off to somebody else. So, you know, it's, it's evolving. You know, a team evolves. You can set it up, you can structure it any way you want, but it's like anything else, it evolves over time and through the project, so. The next piece of this, we know, again, that working with teams can be a challenge. So we wanted to present to you some tools and techniques for being successful. Each of the workshops uh, had a segment for tools and techniques. And all of um, these tools and techniques have been proven over time to really help uh, teams, not just communities, but business teams, organization teams, community teams, uh, to be successful. One of our favorite tools is just the concept of going public. Whereas you tell someone that you're gonna do something, well, then you've put the pressure on yourself to, to fulfill that. And uh, another a simple tool, but one that we find is uh, extremely successful in getting people to, uh, to fall through with what they say they're going to do. 
So it doesn't have to be a press release. It could just be uh, announcing to your friends and family. So announcing to your neighbors what you're going to do. And so the teams were all challenged to go public in, in some way with their intentions. Social mapping uh, was a fun tool for the teams. They would just start off with a blank sheet of paper. Uh, at the very center of that paper, they would just name their project. And then we'd ask them to uh, consider who are the people that can influence, who can impact, who's a, a resource for the specific project or, or need we have. And each one of those names or organizations would be a bubble around that paper. And once they've brainstormed everyone who could be connected to and, and assist in this effort, then they drew lines. And a, a solid line represented that there's somebody from that team who's directly connected to that organization, that person or that resource. Uh, and then a dotted line would say, you know what, we, we don't have a connection to that organization, that resource, that person. And then what they were challenged to do was to draw a bubble on that dotted line and try to recognize somebody in the community that could help them uh, bridge that, um, that gap, somebody that could introduce them to that person or resource. And we find that social mapping is one of the keys to the success of any community effort. Um, there's uh, a wealth of resources in West Virginia, a, a wealth of assistance, uh, a wealth of people who are passionate about the state and want to contribute. So it's really about you know, tapping into that fabric tapping into those resources. My name is Julie Royce. I'm the head of the uh, Manus Committee. The Manus is owned by the International Mother's Day Shrine Organization, but I am the head of a committee that was formed through Turn This Town Around to revitalize and restore the Manus. The tools that the Hub provided were essential. Uh, they taught us how to do all this and gave us the tools to get it done. And the greatest thing about it was that we were never left alone. We never felt alone on these projects. There was always someone we could email and ask questions and they would get a response to us that day. Have you tried this? You need to do this. Maybe this would help. So it was really nice feeling like you were never alone and that you could accomplish things. Each project team had to complete a project shaping worksheet, which is the grant application. Um, and the first, it was, I think, four pages. The first page, they just listed who, who was on their core team. So those are the people that have been coming to the meetings that are um, really going to take responsibility for this project. And then they can have other volunteers outside of this core team. So usually that's about three to four people. Then they moved into a couple different questions where um, we asked the teams to briefly describe their projects, um, what are some challenges that they could face, what are some other funding resources, opportunities that they've explored, if any, um, what other projects could their project lead to, just to kind of get them thinking outside of the box a little bit. Um, then we went into a project activities table, and in that table that's where they actually, it was a timeline for how they saw their project going. And we asked them to identify specific people that, so Amanda Yeager is going to complete this by this date. And then the last part was the budget, and we asked for a very detailed budget. Um, a lot of the groups provide estimates from contractors or different things that they needed, plants or flowers. Um, and they included all that information with it. A lot of teams included different pictures of things, maybe before pictures and then they'll provide after pictures. So that was pretty much the application and pretty basic. Uh, for one thing, there's just not that immediate funding of $1.2 million to renovate this place. So you have to really go in and say, what are the top goals and the top priorities? What needs to be done first? And then you break it down according to that, you set your budgets, all of this was taught to us through this process. I would have never known that before. And they taught us every bit of that, breaking it down, setting your priorities, making your budget, and going after money. Beyond grants, people have come in to help us. Uh, 84 Lumber gave us a discount on the materials that we needed to complete the concession stand. Uh, the city of Grafton has been so helpful in um, helping us with some plumbing issues when we had it. Uh, doing things like that. Volunteers throughout the community have really helped too with running different projects we've had here trying to raise money. Amy Summers had, uh, 
a local delegate for Taylor County has called in to WVU and their engineering department has agreed to to design the heating project for this theater as their some as their spring project. Uh, we've also had an architect, Joe Sinclair from Charleston, drive up here, look at this project, and he said, I'm in, I'm in to help you. And he's trying to get resources and help from down there in Charleston to come in and help us. Talking to some of you, talking with communities as we have for years, we hear a constant thing from them. They say, well, where are we going to get the money to do this? Right? First thing that comes to mind, where's the money going to come from? Well, we like to turn that around. Our constant answer is, if you let the money be a stopping point for you, you will never get anything done in your community. The projects are the focus. You have to, f have to find the good project. And you have to believe in that project. As, as Mary Hunt will tell you, funders will not invest in communities who do not invest in themselves. So having the project clearly identified, the plan well thought out, the community supportive and engaged, and the project moving towards implementation, even without the funding in place, is probably the greatest way you can actually get the funding you need to complete the project. So project first, funding second. My name is Mary Hunt. I'm a senior program officer for the Claude Worthington Benedum Foundation. We're an independent philanthropic organization that operates in um, southwestern Pennsylvania and serves West Virginia and southwestern Pennsylvania. A lot of funding decisions, just like um, any type of financing decision that goes into any investment, the objective of the, of the investment is to have a successful outcome. And so the better a community and the project team or in any stakeholder that's involved in a project is, uh, is knowledgeable about a project, is uh, engaged in developing the solution, is committed to do that, um, and actually has become um, skilled in developing projects and making applications for funds and being accountable for funds, then that a funder is very uh, interested in those community projects that can do that. One of the things we believe in is measuring success, and sometimes it's difficult. Community development often takes um, many, many years in order to see the change that we hope to accomplish. Uh, in Matewan and Grafton, we're going to measure success first by how effectively these projects, the low-hanging fruit projects, are accomplished, and how effectively some of those intermediate-sized projects are accomplished. Um, and down the road, we're going to be watching those bold transformational projects and whether in three to five years there's real progress on those bold projects. Why is this critical? Well, it's critical for several reasons. One is measuring keeps the teams engaged in the work. They have something to look at to see how they're doing. Hopefully, they'll have some early wins, some successes that will motivate them to keep moving. Uh, but they really need to know, why are we doing this project and are we being successful at the change that we seek from this project? A year from now, I hope to see both of these communities doing exactly what they're doing now and more. It's not about a project. It's about a true transformation of how the community interacts and works together. And I think in a year, if you've had successful small projects and you still ha and you can measure the energy and the organization uh, locally, then I think if we look for we would see that as a successful outcome of Turn This Town Around. And I think that a good lesson from Turn This Town Around is that all of those things, big and small, are important. For us, success in these communities will be measured by whether the work continues after we're gone. Do these teams pick up new projects after the projects that we're funding them for are accomplished? Do they continue to work together? Do they maintain the collaboration that they develop during Turn This Town Around? Those are the things we really want to measure, and so we'll be watching that over the, the years following the completion of Turn This Town Around to see whether the work is sustained in some form. Uh, we know that the teams change and morph, the projects change and morph. That's okay. 
as long as some sort of positive work is continuing in each of those communities. In the end, it was never about a project. It was about them building their capacity to complete the project, but then to carry on. And so it's really about the community just experiencing some success um, and continuing on. Whatever next project pops up, whatever challenge pops up, um, hopefully some of the tools and techniques and experience of Turn This Town Around uh, will continuously be used by them to face those challenges, to take advantage of those opportunities. In January, when we're done, that doesn't mean that it's over for those communities. It means, okay, what are we going to do now? So we've done this, so what are we going to do next? Um, I just hope they continue that.